Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. What we have described here is a small community within the city of Jerusalem that decided to live like a commune. They decided to put everything in the pot together. That was what they were led to do. Is that a universal admonition? Obviously it isn't because the church isn't doing that still. We don't say to you when you become a Christian, sell everything you have and give me the money. And we're going to take care of it. What's different about this, and some people say, this makes me very nervous. This seems like socialism or communism or whatever. Remember that 20th century communism was a leader telling you, I'm taking all your stuff and I'm going to redistribute it. And we all know and see that that leader kept a lot for themselves. Here, people of their own free will decided to sell and give and share. They decided to live communally. It was something they were led to do. And Christians throughout history have been led to do that. You see little pockets of it appearing here and there. Those are specific calls for specific people. We see it most uh, notably preserved in the life of monastic communities um, where you sell everything that you have and you turn your back on that and then you live in common with one another. But what's interesting is what we hear at the beginning of Acts chapter 5. A man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's knowledge, he kept some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Here is the first stewardship deception. Remember, this is not required. This is voluntary. But Ananias and Sapphira wanted to look good, but wanted to hold some back for themselves. So they present it and say, we sold this piece of property. Here it is. Almost like Jesus perhaps talked about the people giving their gifts at the treasury how the wealthy would come in and announce, here I am giving my gift. Well, they came in with a great show. We've sold it, here it is. Giving the inference that they are offering it all. Um, Peter. Yes. Why would he have sought the consent of his wife? Well, that's a good question. The question is, why would he consent with his wife? Um, maybe he was enlightened. Maybe um, it was her. Maybe it was her property. Could be an inherited property that she had, or you know, um, you know, maybe this is your first example of happy wife, happy life. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, they um, they they know they worked on this together. It's done with her knowledge, Peter. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of this land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Interesting stewardship reflection for all of us as we reflect on how we give and what we give and our motivation for giving. Peter's saying, you know, aligned to us. It's between you and God. Now when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. 
This is hardcore, folks. And great fear seized all who heard it, I bet. <laughs> did you hear what Ananias did? And Peter confronted him and he dropped dead. The young men came and wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. Another reference to Jewish burial custom, immediate burial. After an interval of three hours, his wife came in not knowing what happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, oh yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead, so they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. So what's the takeaway from this? I think the takeaway is deception. Deception. Your assets that God has blessed you with are yours to do with as you please. God has given us guidelines. God has asked for us to give at least a tenth back to him. Actually, in the New Testament, it's even stronger than that. That was the Old Testament admonition. In the New Testament, it says everything that you have belongs to the Lord and should be at the Lord's disposal and that we need to be about discerning what that is. But I think the important thing to take away from this passage is that when we do that discernment, we need to be honest with ourselves. And let's not play games. If we don't feel like we're where we ought to be, then say, God, I don't feel like I'm where I ought to be, but I'm trying. Help me get to where you want me to be. But not this whole charade of look how great I am and look what I offer and whatever. Um, and may God grant us the grace that we don't drop dead when we <laughs> do these things. Father Derek, yes. are you going to preach on this? Or? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that would be an effective stewardship sermon to preach on that? If you want to come back next week, <laughs> make sure. I can only fit in so many burials in a week. Right? <laughs> Now many signs and wonders were done among the people through the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. There they are again, back in that huge temple complex, back in those colonnades, where they can gather large crowds right outside, where the Sanhedrin meets, right in their face, talking and preaching about Jesus. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. Yet even more than ever believers were added to the Lord, great numbers of both men and women, so that even they carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats in order that Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he came by. A great number of people would also gather from towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all cured." So we got a movement going on. Word has spread. Something is happening. God is working through these people. And so just like some of the stories we read about Jesus where people would cut holes in the roof or try to get close to Jesus, they're just trying to get somewhere where Peter and John and the other apostles are moving and teaching and talking so that they could be healed. Then the high priest took action. And he and all who were with him, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, being filled with jealousy, arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison.